Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, we are only a few days away from Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As Sherry said, this is so exciting. It's an exciting time of year. And, uh, you know, uh, many people have been asking me about God's spring holy days and how to prepare and to keep them. So today we are going to look at them and tell you all you need to know. Are you ready? Let's begin by reviewing which are God's holy days, his moedim in Hebrew, which means appointed times. We find them in Leviticus 23. The Lord spoke again to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. So you see here, there's eight of them. There's the weekly uh, Shabbat, and there's seven annual holy days. Four in the spring, the green ones, which are uh, Passover. In Hebrew, it's Pesach. Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Matzot, and then you got First Fruits, which is Bikurim, and then you got the Feast of Pentecost, which is Shavuot. And the other three in yellow there, these are the Fall Feast. Now, these are the only days God calls holy. There is no Christmas or Easter on this list. If you wonder why, please watch our teaching called Holy Days or Holidays on our YouTube channel. Now let's look at when these spring holy days are. So you can see from this slide that next week we begin the spring holy days with three of them within eight days. That is why the timing of today's teaching is so important so that you know how to prepare and that you understand biblically what is expected of each of these holy days in 2022. Note, Passover is not a high Sabbath, nor is the Feast of First Fruits, but the first day and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are high Sabbaths. And what's a high Sabbath? Well, you all know what a Sabbath is and when it is, right? It's from sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday. And on Sabbath, you are to do no work, okay? But um, have a holy convocation and meet together and meet with God. So what's a high Sabbath? It's when on one of God's holy days, God asks us to do no work, but to have a holy convocation, like the first and the seventh day of unleavened bread. Note, on this slide, you, you, should, uh, you should have already received this slide in January. I sent out uh, both the calendar and this slide. The ones that are in bold are the ones that are high Sabbaths. And so you can see here that Passover is not in bold. So you can work on Passover, but on first day of unleavened bread and on the seventh day of unleavened bread, God says it's to be a holy convocation and you should do no work, but you can work on the Purim, not a problem. So it's important to know, to know that. So in other words, there will be three Sabbaths in one week. There's the regular Sabbath. Next Saturday, April 16th, and there will be the one of April 23rd, but also on April 22nd, so starting on the 21st at sunset, is the seventh day of unleavened bread. And as Sherry said, God asked us to have a holy convocation and do no work. So we will be having a holy convocation, as she mentioned. We'll be receiving a Zoom invite, and we'll be having a service on the Thursday evening. Uh, so please note that also here about first fruits, it's always on a Sunday within the seven days of unleavened bread. Now, some uh, messianics wrongly celebrated on the Sunday after unleavened bread. But Yeshua, 
was our first fruits. And he raised on the feast of first fruits three days after Pesach, not 10 days after Pesach, right? So that is why it has to be during those seven days. And uh, we spoke on that um, at our other teaching on Bikurim last year. So now, now that you know when God's feast will be in 2022, um, but while most of God's Moedim are a 24-hour day on the calendar, I want you to know that Passover is actually a meal, not a day. Look at Leviticus 23, verses 4 and 5. God said to Moses, these are the appointed feasts of Adonai, holy convocations, which you are to proclaim in their appointed season during the first month on the 14th day of the month in the evening is Adonai's Passover. No, notice it didn't just say Passover was on the 14th day of the month. It's in the evening. It specifies. And uh, so it is a meal. It says it's a meal that is to be eaten at the end of the 14th day of Aviv in the evening. So Wednesday evening, it's after sunset. So it's actually eaten on the 15th of Aviv, which is uh, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is when we celebrate and we have our Passover meal. Now remember, they were to take a lamb on the 10th day of Aviv and to keep it and examine it for four days. And then on the 14th day at twilight, which is 3 p.m., they were to uh, slaughter the lamb so that it could be eaten that evening. So that evening is the beginning of the 15th of Aviv. And uh, so, it's, like I said, it's the first day of unleavened bread. And that is why God instructs us to not eat leaven, which is hamets in Hebrew, with our Passover meal. It talks about in Exodus 34, 25. And this is because it is actually eaten on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It says, you are not to offer the blood of my sacrifice with hamets, which is um, leaven, like I said. So you're not to have your Passover meal with leaven, nor should the sacrifice of the Passover festival remain until morning. And so that is also why Passover is considered part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it's actually this meal you have it on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, if you look on a Jewish calendar in Israel, you will not see a separate Passover and a Feast of Unleavened Bread, but you will either see Pesach or Matzot lasting for seven days. On this uh, 2019, I didn't get a 2022 one, but anyways, it's a 2019 Jewish calendar. They called it Pesach. It is the same with the Feast of First Fruits, Bikurim. It is on the Sunday, as I said, during the seven days of unleavened bread. But do you see it on this Jewish calendar? It should have been right here on the 21st. There's no Bikurim mentioned. All three feasts, Pesach, Matzot, and Bikurim, are all lumped into one feast on the calendar. And some call these seven days Pesach, but some call it Matzot. It's all one feast. So I hope that's understood. And you can see here, they've got Erev Pesach, and then they've got Pesach 1, day 1, Pesach 2, Pesach 3. It actually should be Matzot, but like I said, they all call it the same name. So on some calendar, they're calling it all Pesach. What's important to understand is that they're all considered together as one feast. So we know when God's holy days are this year, but why do we need to keep them? Well, in Exodus 12, God said, this day is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Adonai, throughout your generations, you are to keep it as an eternal ordinance. And also in Exodus 
twelve seventeen, he said, so you are to observe the Feast of Mazat. For on this very same day, have I brought your ranks out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this day throughout your generations as an eternal ordinance. God asked us to observe Pesach and Matzot forever. Why? To remember. Remember how God saved his people from Egypt. To commemorate. And, and it should be a memorial, he says. Notice these verses say that they are an eternal ordinance. So do you think it still applies today? Well, yes, eternal means forever. So in 2022, God still wants us to keep these holy days to remember. And, you know, to remember is actually something that is repeated and emphasized multiple times. You saw two of them, but here's three more. Look at Exodus 13, 3. Moses said, uh, said to the people, remember this day on which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by a strong hand had an I brought you out from this place. And in Deuteronomy 7, 18, it says, you are to be sure to remember what Adonai your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. And, and again in Deuteronomy 16, 3, do this so that all the days of your life, you will remember the day when you came out from the land of Egypt. These verses are clear indication that we are not to forget this day. And this feast is to serve uh, as that constant reminder of that deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And we are also to use this memorial to teach our children. Look at Exodus 12. Also, you are to observe this event as an eternal ordinance for you and your children. When you come into the land which Adonai will give you, as he has promised, you are to keep the ceremony. Now, when it happens that your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to say, it is the sacrifice of Adonai's Passover, because he passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt, when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our households. So that is why we are to keep Pesach and Matzot still today in 2022 to remember and also to teach our children how God freed Israel from their slavery and how he saved them from Egypt with a mighty hand. But now, what about how? How are we to keep Passover today? Well, should we follow the example of the Jews? This reminds me, when we first started our church, there was a lady attending our church at the time. And she said, well, we should just follow the example of the Jews. It's a Jewish feast after all. Really? Let's look at that. If you want to know, Jews at Passover, they have a Passover supper or a seder. In Wikipedia, seder, it means an order or an arrangement of the steps that are performed at different points in the Passover meal. And these steps are established by ancient rabbis in the first two centuries. And the Jews, they use a Haggadah, which means a telling. It's derived from the Mishnah and contains the narrative of the Israelite exodus from Egypt. It also includes special blessings and rituals and commentaries from the Talmud. But why am I putting a slide from Wikipedia? Where is the Seder Supper and the Haggadah in the Bible? If you look in this book, you won't find it anywhere. These are man-made Jewish traditions, the Seder and the Haggadah. 
Also, the Jewish setter, the meal, it has parsley, it has bitter herbs, apples, nuts, spices, a lamb bone, and an egg. Like in the picture, you can see that. But when you look at the scriptures, we find that the Passover started far more simply. In Exodus 12, verse 8, we read, they are to eat the meat, which is lamb, that night, roasted over fire with matzah, which is unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. They are to eat it. Where are the other items? You see, at Passover, in Exodus 12, God asked only that the Passover lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread be eaten. Also in the Bible, we see no specific order or setter in how this meal is to be eaten. Now, according to Wikipedia, the Jewish tradition of the setter supper actually began in the days when the Hebrews were exiled to Babylon. It is also from their time in Babylon that they began adding the other elements to the Passover meal, like the parsley, the applesauce, etc. Now, while there is nothing wrong with most of these items, like the parsley and the applesauce, uh, that were added to tell the story of Israel's liberation from slavery in Egypt. One of them, the egg, is actually a pagan fertility symbol uh, that they brought into God's feast from their days in Babylon. Now, remember the Jewish calendar with pagan names that they inherited from their days in Babylon? Uh, if, if you didn't if you hear this teaching, please look at our YouTube channel for a teaching called God's Calendar. But uh, essentially, they, they changed all of the names of, uh, uh, from the Bible, like Aviv is no longer Aviv, it's called Nisan. And they've given other names. And one of those names that they included is Tammuz. Tammuz was the... Uh, the sun god, the son of the sun god. And uh, the Jews, uh, they gave a month on their calendar to Tammuz. So anyways, more on that, please look at the teaching on YouTube. But um, you see the Jewish calendar with pagan names that were inherited from their days in Babylon. Well, the Jews didn't just adopt Babylonian calendar names. They also adopted some of their pagan symbols in the celebration of God's Moedim. So do you think we ought to look to the Jews and copy how they celebrate Passover? I don't think so. They know their Jewish celebrations best. I totally agree, but they are not keeping Passover as God asked. They have added many things that are not in the Bible. And some, like the egg, are actually pagan symbols. And in the Torah, God tells us not to worship him in the way pagans worship their gods. Look at Deuteronomy 12, 30 to 32. It says, take heed to yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire after the God saying, how do these nations serve their gods? Like, how do the Babylonians serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe. So what did he command us? He says, you shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And they've added a whole bunch of things. Oh, are we to add pagan fertility symbols like the egg to God's Passover or any other item for that matter? I don't think it's a good idea. In Exodus 12, we read, 
<clears throat> your lamb is to be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You must watch over it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight. This is 3 p.m. They are to take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the crossbeam of the houses where they will eat it. And then at verse 11, it says, also, you are to eat it in this way with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in haste. It is Adonai's Passover. So Moses' instructions about selecting a lamb and slaughtering it ourselves. Is this something we should be doing today? Should we be slaughtering lambs in our backyards every year for Passover? What many people might not realize is that the Exodus 12 instructions were specific instructions that applied only to the first Passover event in Egypt. Slaughtering the lamb at home, putting the blood on the doorpost and eating it in haste with your belt fastened and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand were instructions that applied only to the first Passover in Egypt. And after this first Passover, God gave these instructions for keeping Passover in Deuteronomy 16. It says, observe the month of Aviv and keep the Passover to Adonai your God. For in the month of Aviv, Adonai your God brought you out from Egypt by night. You are to sacrifice the Passover offering to Adonai your God from the flock and the herd. In the place Adonai chooses to make his name dwell. So note, it talks about sacrifice and that it's to be done only in the place where God chooses to make his name dwell. So the big question is, can we biblically observe these Passover instructions today? The answer is no. Why? Well, as we just saw, it can only be done in the place that God chose as the dwelling for his name. And look at Deuteronomy 16, the following two verses, verses five and six. God adds, you must not sacrifice the Passover in any town Yahweh gives you, except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down at, on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. So we cannot sacrifice the Passover in any town, not in Ottawa, not in Montreal, not even in Kempville, but only in the place God chose as a dwelling for his name. And where is the place that God chose as a dwelling for his name? Israel, in Deuteronomy 12, 10 and 11, says, but when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land, this is the promised land, which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, then there will be, where? There will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name dwell, okay? as promised land, which is Israel. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice offerings, which you vow to the Lord. So it's clear that the Passover is to be killed and eaten only in Israel, more specifically, where he put his name. And that is the temple in Jerusalem. Look at 1 Kings 8, 28, 29. 
Yet regard the prayer of your servant as his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day, towards the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. Now, this is the only place the Bible allows us to celebrate the Passover meal. So what if someone lives in Jerusalem today? Can they biblically observe Passover? Well, no, because you see, there is no temple. The lamb was only to be slaughtered at the tabernacle and then later at the temple. And even the Jews know that. And that is why if you look in their Haggadah, it always ends with the phrase, next year in Jerusalem. Why? Because they too, they know that you can only celebrate the biblical Passover at the temple in Jerusalem. And since there is no te temple currently in Jerusalem, they cannot celebrate it. But they hope that next year they will finally be able to. Or do we? But not only do we need a temple in Jerusalem to be able to celebrate the Passover, but we also need Levite priests to carry out the Passover sacrifice and the offerings. The Passover lamb is to be a burnt offering and, the on, and only the Levite priests can do burnt offerings. Look at Leviticus 1, verse one to five. And the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of the witnessing saying, speak thou to the sons of Israel and thou shalt say to them, a man of you that offereth to the Lord a sacrifice of beef, not a beef, of beasts, <laughs> that is of oxen or of sheep, and offereth slain sacrifices. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice, like Passover, and of the drove of oxen, he shall offer a male beast without him at the door of the tabernacle of witnessing to make the Lord pleased to him. And he shall set his hands on the head of the sacrifice, and it shall be acceptable and profiting into the cleansing of him. And he shall offer a calf before the Lord. And the priests, the sons of Aaron, Levites, shall offer its blood, and they shall throw it against the sides of the altar that is in front of the entrance to the tabernacle. So here it's talking about the tabernacle, but we know that was while they were in the desert. And then since then, they went into the promised land. It's been at the temple, that is the altar, and where the priests are to do burnt offerings. And so since the, there is no temple today or functioning priesthood in Jerusalem, we just cannot offer this Passover instruction to slaughter the lamb at the place where Yahweh chose to make his name dwell. What that means is that we cannot actually have the Passover today, since the lamb itself is the Passover. In fact, that is the reason why most Jews traditionally don't even serve lamb at their setters, only a lamb bone in the plate. So how can this be? It is in the Torah. God asked that we keep Passover forever, but we can't biblically keep Passover? Makes no sense. Well, remember when we did the Ten Commandments series and we saw that there are 613 instructions in the Torah? We also saw that we cannot actually keep all 613. Why? Because not all of them apply. For example, circumcision. It applies only to men. So women doesn't apply to them, right? And there's many others that apply only for kings, for farmers, and for different things. But notice here, 
that roughly one third, 202 of the 613 instructions require priests at the temple in Jerusalem. And since there is no priest or temple currently, we just cannot keep them like Passover. So the point here is that we cannot biblically observe Passover today in 2022. Now, the same can be said about the Feast of First Fruits, Bikurim. Look in Leviticus 23, 9 to 14. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and tell them, when you have come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you are to bring the Omer of the first fruit of the harvest to the Kohen. That's the Hebrew word for priest. You are to bring it to the priest. And he, the priest, is to wave the Omer before Adonai to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Shabbat, the priest is to wave it. On the day when you wave the Omer, you are to offer a male lamb without blemish, one year old, as a burnt offering. Who offers the burnt offerings? It's the priest at the altar, right? And you bring the grain offering with it. Should be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Adonai for a soothing aroma, a drink offering, etc. But who is waving the omer? Is it us? No, it's the Levite priest. He's the only one that can do this. So we cannot biblically keep Bikurim today either, because it requires the service of a priest at the temple. And it is the same thing for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look at Leviticus 23, 6 to 8. On the 15th day of that month, Yahweh's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present to Yahweh an offering made by fire, a burnt offering. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Who does the burnt offerings? It's the priest at the altar in Jerusalem, at the temple. So this lets us know that this feast also cannot be observed biblically. So then, if we cannot celebrate Passover, as the Bible asks us, because there are no priests or temple in Jerusalem, then what are we to do? Do we just not celebrate them at all? Well, no. God told us that we must celebrate them every year, forever. To, for what? To remember what he has done. Remember? Well, look at Exodus 12, 14. This day is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Adonai. Throughout your generations, you are to keep as an eternal ordinance. There are other aspects of the feast that we can do and are commanded to observe, such as having the memorial meal with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. But as far as the actual Passover is concerned, we simply have to wait until our Messiah returns and reestablishes the priesthood at the temple in Jerusalem before we can enjoy Passover in all its fullness. Understand? So for Passover in 2022, we can eat whatever we want. Kosher, of course. And we do not have to follow any special order or do anything particular, except one thing. Remember what he has done and celebrate it. And that is what we are going to do on the 15th at Jim Durrell Center. We will eat a meal and remember what God has done. Amen. What about the Feast of Unleavened Bread? How are we to celebrate it today? Well, just like for Passover, God wants us to remember. He said here, so you are to observe the Feast of Mazot, 
feast of unleavened bread. For on this very same day, have I brought your ranks out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this day throughout your generations as an eternal ordinance. So for seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we will remember. That's what he wants us to do. Also, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a feast where we are to clean our homes of all products that have leaven and to have no leaven in our homes for seven days. Look at Exodus 13. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. So before April 15th, you need to start cleaning out your house. Go through all your cupboards, your pantries, everywhere, and gather all items that have leaven, and they need to be removed from your house. Do you know this is uh, actually the origin of spring cleaning? This is where it actually started. You know, and it's important to say that it's an exercise that people say, oh, that won't take me very long. It's only in the pantry and you go bing, 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 and you gather and you take it out of your house. But God actually wants us to um, take our time and be thorough and go through everywhere. Make sure there's not a crumb left of a cookie or a cracker or something that had leaven in it. We need to clean our house thoroughly. And I will explain the reason why uh, on the next slide. But I just want to mention one more thing that we are to do during those seven days. Not only we're, we're supposed to clean our house of leaven before the seven days and have no leaven, but every day we're to eat unleavened bread. It says unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days. So it doesn't mean you can only eat unleavened bread and you can't eat anything else for seven days. No. But every day you should have at least a little piece of unleavened bread because we're instructed to do that. And when we will have that piece, we're gonna remember, right? We're gonna say, why are we doing this anyways? Because God commanded us to do that so that we can remember. So it's a sign, right? It's important to do. And so Sherry and I, we, we, uh, we did that. Uh, we do that every year during the seven days. Even if we finished our meal and we didn't have, uh, we take out the, the matzah and we'll have a piece and every day we need to have. And even our cat last year, he started, he was seeing us eating these uh, crackers and we thought, you're not gonna want this, but he was eating the matzah with us. So, well, praise God, even cats can, can keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? And um, so we're to use these seven days of matzah, okay, to do some soul searching. In Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7, Paul wrote, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For our Passover lamb, the Messiah has been sacrificed. Leaven here, again, is synonymous with sin. And we are in leaven because Yeshua, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed and he's taken our sin. But this um, seven days of no leaven and, and uh, especially the exercise, I was mentioning the exercise of being thorough and cleaning your house. It's meant to have a, a spiritual connection to the physical actions of cleaning the house. While you're cleaning your house and you're working uh, thoroughly to do that, you need to start looking at your own heart and look to see if there's any leaven, any sin that might be there. And you need to clean that out at the same time. You see how the physical exercise has a direct relationship with the spiritual. God intends for us to, while we're doing this, and why are we doing this? Oh yes, we should also check our hearts and we need to clean that out. So the exercise and discipline 
of cleaning our physical house of leaven, it trains and strengthens our resolve in cleaning our spiritual house. The physical exercise prompts us to spiritually seek out our souls for any leaven. So then, should we be doing this in 2022? Well, I definitely recommend it for everyone. One other thing that we are instructed to do on the Feast of Medjot is to bring an offering to Adonai, to thank God for his faithfulness. In Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17, it says, three times a year, all your males are to appear before Adonai, your God, in the place he chooses at the Feast of Medjot, Feast of Unlearned Bread, the Feast of Shavuot, which is Pentecost, coming soon, and the Feast of Sukkot in the fall. No one should appear before Adonai empty-handed. The gift of each man's hand shall be according to the blessing Adonai, your God, has given you. So here it says three times a year, God asks us to bring an offering. No, it's not the same thing as tithes, okay? We recently had a, a teaching called money it's on our youtube channel and we talked about the importance of tithing right but this is not the same thing tithing is a thing you take what 10 percent, the first 10 percent of your income and give it back to god but an offering is above and beyond and god asks three times a year okay according to the blessing adonai your god has given you to bring him an offering so we want to offer you the opportunity to be obedient in this regard. So on April 15th, we will have a basket on one of the tables so that you can drop off your offerings. And we'll have donation envelopes there as well. So you can get a tax receipt at the end of the year. But note, if you're not at Passover, April 15th at Jim Durrell, you can still give your offering by mailing us the check or by going on our website and, and uh, giving your donation there. Just one more thing about offerings. We are to bring this offering to Adonai, but note these offerings are supposed to be given in Jerusalem at the temple. It says at the place which he chooses, and we've already determined where that is, right? So it's important to remember that to obey Today, because there is no temple in Jerusalem, we can't actually give our free will offering at the place God chooses to put his name. But we can still do it as part of our memorial because we can only observe them in a memorial right now, as we explained. But you can still do that as a memorial and bring your offering for April 15th. So, we have looked at why we should keep Passover, right? To remember Passover and unleavened bread. And we've looked at the when we should keep them and for how long. And we've also looked at the how we can keep them today in 2022. But there remains one question we need to look at about these feasts. It's the who. Who can keep them? Is Passover and unleavened bread only for Jews? Can Gentiles like us keep them? The Jews do keep Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So many have looked at these days as just for the Jews. Well, is that true? Well, first of all, we know that the Jews do not represent all 12 tribes of Israel that celebrated Passover in Egypt and in the desert. So oh, we also know that God's holy days were given to all who choose to follow Yahweh. Look at Numbers 15. The community will have the same rule for you as well as for the resident outsider. It will be a lasting statute throughout your generations. As for you, so for the outsider, will it be before Adonai. The same Torah. And the same regulations, including Passover and unleavened bread, will apply to both you and the outsider residing among you. 
right? So Passover is for us, for all of us. And these days are given to all who choose to be grafted into Israel and follow after the ways of God. But what about Exodus 12, verse 48? It says, but if an outsider dwells with you, who would keep the Passover for Adonai, all his males must be circumcised. Then let him draw near and keep it, keep Passover. You will be like one who is native in the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat from it. So does this mean that physically uncircumcised believers today aren't allowed to take part in a Passover meal? Well, should people who hold Passover centers in their homes or like a Jim Durrell, should we be asking to check people at the door if they're circumcised? The key here to understanding this passage is that they cannot eat the Passover lamb. So technically, since the Passover in this context refers specifically to the sacrifice lamb, and the only way to offer the Passover sacrifice is to do it by a priest at the temple in Jerusalem, then we cannot, we do not need to worry about this in 2022. Because you know what? If lamb is served, it is not the one that was sacrificed by the priest at the temple in Jerusalem. It is lamb that was slain by butchers at Loblaws or Walmart. Again, today, Passover is simply a memorial and not a real Passover event. So circumcised and uncircumcised can take part in this memorial. But when Yeshua returns, only circumcised will be able to take part in the Passover because it will be done at the, uh, the lamb will be slaughtered by the Levite priest at the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. Amen. So I hope I've cleared a lot of confusion about Passover and unleavened bread. But in conclusion, Passover is a meal and it is part of the feast of unleavened bread. And while we cannot biblically eat Passover or the feast of unleavened bread, we are still required to celebrate it forever to remember what God did. And when Yeshua returns and reestablishes the burnt offerings at the temple in Jerusalem, we will then be able to celebrate it once again. Amen. And I leave you with just a few pointers in case you were taking notes and you've never kept uh, Passover unleavened bread before and you wondered, oh, Jean spoke quickly. Well, Passover, we're going to eat a meal this year on April 15th at sunset. And we're going to remember what God has done for Israel, how he freed them from Egypt. And we're to do no work. This is important. Okay, it's high Sabbath on the 1st, which is April 16th, and the seventh day of Mazot, April 22nd at sunset, meaning the day of April 23rd. And we're to clean our homes of leaven, okay, before April 15th, and clean our hearts of sin. And we're to eat each day of the seven days of unleavened bread. We're to eat unleavened bread. Okay. And we're to get together. It's a holy convocation. So on the first, which is on the 15th at sunset, we're getting together. And on the seventh, which is going to be the 21st at sunset, we're having also an event on Zoom. And we're to bring an offering to thank God for his faithfulness. So here are. Uh, this is my message for this morning.